The .NET framework consists of two pieces. First is the runtime, which runs your applications, and the second is a collection of classes known as the Base Class Library, or BCL for short. And the BCL consists of a number of classes providing basic functionality that makes up the .NET framework. There are a number of classes that make your life as a developer easier, and the classes in the BCL can be used by all of your .NET applications, as well as by multiple languages, such as Visual Basic, C Sharp, and others, as long as those languages support .NET, of course. The classes in the framework are grouped into namespaces, and the namespaces organize classes into common blocks of functionality. And within each namespace, each class has a unique name. Let's take a look at some of the namespaces in the BCL. There's system. This provides basic functionality. All of the structures and classes that comprise the data types are in here. String is in here. Arrays are in system. Math classes are in system. Lots of things in there. System.data contains the classes that you'll use to work with databases, SQL Server, Oracle, and others. System.diagnostics has classes for diagnosing an application, event logging's in here, performance counters, etc. System.globalization provides classes that you can use to globalize an application. System.io has classes that let you do file input and output, working with files, working with directories. System.text contains the String Builder class, which we'll look at later on, which gives you a very efficient way of building strings. It also contains regular expressions, giving you the ability to do some fairly complex matching of patterns. So for example, if you wanted to make sure that the user inputted five digits for zip code or a string that was an appropriate email address. System.web contains ASP.NET for building web applications. System.windows.forms contains the Windows forms you'll use to build Windows applications. And System.xml contains the classes for reading and writing XML. You can use all of these classes in your code. And so code that you write winds up being a mix of code that's specific to your language and also code that uses .NET Framework classes. So for example, compare two examples here. On the left is Visual Basic, on the right is C Sharp. And this code is going to take a restaurant bill and figure out what part is the dollars and what part is the cents. So the first line of code in both examples creates a variable called amount, declared as a decimal, and stores 45.61 to it. The second line of code creates two additional decimal variables, dollars and cents. The third line uses the truncate method from the decimal structure, which is defined in the .NET framework, and truncates the amount. Truncate returns the integer portion of this decimal number, so dollars is equal to 45. The next line of code subtracts dollars from amount, that equals cents. Next, we use the right line method of the console class, which is in the .NET framework, to display the total bill, and then in the final line of code, use right line to display the dollars and the cents. So you can see that the code has a lot in common. The use of decimal.truncate is the same. The use of console.writeline is the same. Those are both defined in the .NET framework. The parts that are specific to Visual Basic are the dim as, the use of D to denote decimal, the fact that decimal is capitalized, the use of underscores line continuation character, and the use of the ampersand to concatenate strings. Over on the C-sharp side, decimal is in lowercase, M is used to denote decimal, plus is used to concatenate strings, there's no line continuation character, and you use a semicolon to denote the end of the line. So you can see that this code is pretty similar between Visual Basic and C Sharp because all of the work being done in this code is using .NET Framework classes. So let's take a look at some .NET Framework classes and see how we can perform some common tasks. One task you might need to do is generate random numbers. And for that you can use the random class from the .NET Framework. 
Generated random numbers can start with a seed value. You can use the default seed value or you can specify your own. And the next method of the random class will generate the next random number in a sequence. So you can create a variable based on the random class and then call next each time you need a new random number. You can also use the environment class to get information about a computer. Environment provides information on the computer and the environment in which the computer is running. There are a number of properties in the environment class that you can use, such as machine name or username, OS version to return the name and version of the operating system, current directory tells you where the program's running, and you can use version to get the version of the CLR, Common Language Runtime. That's the .NET runtime. Then if you want to refer to My Documents, Desktop, etc., you can use the get folder path method and a special folder enumeration. Let's see a demo of these two classes and how you use them. We've got the sample application running. Let's take a look at a couple .NET Framework classes. First, we'll generate random numbers. That brings us into the random numbers method. And here, I'm going to create a new instance of the random class. Random is a class in the .NET framework found in the system namespace. So I create a variable called random number and I declare that as a new instance of the random class. Now I can call the next method of the random class to generate random numbers. So I'll generate three of them and display the results. There are three random numbers. Next I want to create another random number well, I want to specify that that random number should be less than 100. So I can pass to the next method an argument of 100. And here's the next random number in the sequence, as long as that number is under 100. Finally, I can pass two arguments to the next method. And here I'm specifying that I want the next random number in the sequence, but I want that number to be between 500 and 750. Here it is. and that's generating random numbers. Next we'll look at the environment class. The environment class gives us the ability to retrieve information about the computer and the environment it's running under. Environment is a static class in the .NET framework and that means that I don't have to create an instance of it to use it. I can just type code like environment.machine name and that returns the name of the machine or username to return the name of the user OS version gives me the version of the operating system. Current directory tells me where this application is currently running. And version returns the version of the framework. So here's machine name and username. The OS version, the current directory is where the executable file is running. And the CLR version, which is the version of the .NET runtime. Another thing we can do with the environment class is refer to folders on the hard drive, particularly special folders like desktop or my pictures, etc. So if I type environment dot special folder dot, here's a list of folders that I can reference. Desktop, favorites, history, my documents, my pictures, etc. I don't have to type the full path of these folders. This also accounts for the fact that my documents and some of these other folders are in folders that are specific to the current user. So what we want to do is copy a file to the desktop. So we're going to create an instance of the file info class, which is in the system.io namespace. And this variable sum file now references the file c colon backslash test.txt. When you create an instance of the file info class, you pass as an argument the file you want to work with. Now I can use the copy to method and copy that file to the desktop. So if we look at the desktop, there's no test.txt file. Now we'll copy this file to the desktop, and there it is. 
So you've seen this demo using the random class to generate random numbers, using the environment class to get information on the computer and the environment, and we also took a quick look at the file info class to work with a file. So once you identify which class in the .NET framework contains the functionality you want, then it's just a question of learning what methods to use to perform actions and what properties to use to return the information you're looking for. Let's continue our look at the .NET Framework by seeing how you can use .NET Framework classes to work with XML. The system.xml namespace contains a number of classes that you can use to read and write XML. And as a quick background to XML, XML documents are based on elements. An element is comprised of a start tag, content, and an end tag. Elements can contain other elements, and attributes contain information about elements. So here's a small piece of XML that demonstrates this. The first line is a start tag for the chapter's element. And the final line is the closing tag, or end tag, for the chapter's element. The chapter's element has an attribute named total, and that has a value of two, telling us that there are two chapters in here. Now we have two chapter elements. They start with a start tag of chapter, then the content, variables and data types, or using the .NET framework, and then these end with the end tag denoted by the forward slash. So this right here is XML showing us chapters and within that individual chapters. To write XML files, we can use the XML Writer class. And we can use this to write XML to a file or in memory. And you'll use the create method of the XML Writer class to create a new instance of the class and you pass to that the name of the XML file that you want to create. You can use the XML Writers class to control how XML is written. You can specify that elements should be indented, specify what character to use to indent, and also specify what character to use for line breaks. To write the actual XML, You'll typically use write start document to write the XML declaration at the top of the file. Use write start element to add an opening tag. Write end element to write a closing tag. Use write attribute string to write an attribute and its value. And then write element to add an element and its value all at the same time. To read XML files, you'll use the XML Reader class. To read XML files, you can use the XML Reader class. And you can use that to read an XML file either from disk or from memory. Just as with XML Writer, you use the create method to create a new instance of the class and you pass to it the XML file that you want to read. Then you can use the read method to read each node in the XML one at a time. You can use node type to determine if the node's an element or if it's text. You can use the read to following method to read through the XML until you find a specific element. So if you're looking for the chapter element, you can use the read to following method and pass to it the name of that element. That will then read through the XML until it finds the next element with that name. So you can use read to following to loop through the XML file one element at a time. And then to get the content of an element, you can use read inner XML. Let's see a demo of writing and reading XML files. I'm here in the sample application. Let's look at an example of writing and reading XML. I'll press C, and that brings us into the write and read XML method. So we're ultimately going to use the XML writer class to create XML. Before we do that, there are a couple things we want to do first. First, we want to create an instance of the XML Writer Settings class to control how the document's written. So we'll create a variable called settings as a new instance of that class, and then set the indent property to true, and set the new line cars property to control cars dot carriage return line feed. In order to do this, we need to take into account the fact that there are literally thousands of classes in the .NET framework. And by default, the compiler is not set up to use them all. So to be able to say XML Writer Settings and not specify where it came from, 
actually added at the beginning of this document the import statement. To see why this is necessary, let's comment this out. If we don't have the import in here, then when we come down and look at this code, notice that the compiler complains and says XML Writer settings is not defined. It also tells me that XML Writer is not defined. And that's because the compiler at this point doesn't know where this class XML Writer or XML Writer settings is contained. It's not contained in my project. I didn't write this class. These classes are not contained in the system namespace. The compiler basically wants to know where are these classes defined or contained. So by adding the import statement at the top here, I'm telling the compiler to include system.xml as a place that the compiler will go and look for the definition of these classes. The alternative is to be explicit about it. I can say system.xml dot and then that also tells the compiler but I would have also had to do that for XML writer and any other classes I'm using in that namespace. So by putting the imports at the top I can avoid that extra typing. Okay, next we want to create an instance of the XML writer class by calling the create method and passing it two parameters. First of all, what is the XML file we're going to write? And then secondly, and optionally, what instance of the XML writer settings class do we want to use to control how the XML is written? And now we can call methods of the writer class. I call write start document to write the XML declaration. Then I write a chapters element. I'm going to add to it an attribute named total with a value of 2. Then I'm going to write a chapter element and include the content. So this will write chapter, then the content of data types, variables, and operators, and close that tag. Then I'm going to write a language fundamentals element which includes the start tag chapter, the content language fundamentals, and the closing tag. Then I'll call write end element, which will close the currently open element of chapters. And then finally, I'll identify that I'm done writing the document, and then I'll close the instance of the writer. At this point, I should have in the root directory an XML file called test. There it is. Now let's open this. I'll open it in Notepad, and here's the XML. So I first used write start document to write this XML declaration. Then I used write start element to write this chapters tag. I used write attribute string to add the attribute total and the value of two. Then I used write element twice, first to write this chapter, then to write the second chapter, and then I used write end element to close this chapters tag. So there's my XML. Next I want to read that XML. So I'm going to create an instance of the XML reader class. This reader variable will represent that. I call the create method of XML reader and I pass in the name of the XML I want to read. So now reader references that XML file. And I can use the read method to read the elements in this XML one at a time. I'll put that in a while loop. So this line of code here, while reader.read says, as long as the read method of reader returns something, execute the following code. If the node type of what reader returns is text, then display the value. So let's do that a couple times. The first time I read, the node type is the declaration which is not text, so let's call read again. Now, the node type is white space. Let's keep going. This time, the node type is element. That's the chapters element. We'll go again. White space. Element, that's chapter. 
So hopefully the next one is text, and it is. And now we're going to read the value of that text, which is the contents of that first tag. And we can write that. So we go again. We get an end element that closed that first chapter tag. Next up, more white space. Next up should be the opening element, the start element for the second chapter's tag. And then should be text. That's good. And that text is the contents of the second element, language fundamentals. Finally, the end element of chapters. Lastly, more white space. So this is the end element of chapters. The previous end element was chapter. And then finally, we close the file. So read read every single element one at a time in a forward fashion. And when we found elements that were of type text, we used the value property of reader to see what was in there. And that displayed the contents of the two elements. Alternatively, we can also use read to following to go directly to a specific element, and then use read inner XML to read the contents. We create another instance of XML Reader, specifying that we want to use this XML file, and then we'll do a similar loop. Now the reason we need to create another instance of XML Reader is because the reader is forward only. So we've already looped through the entire contents of test XML. We can't go back and start again. So we close the reader and then open a new one, and that will start at the top of the file. That's why we need to create two instances of XML Reader to read this file twice. Well, now we can say read to following and specify a particular element. So now we go directly to the first chapter element and then use the read inner XML method to display the content of it. Do that again, go to the next chapter element and display the contents of that. And then, since there are no additional chapter elements, we're done and we close the instance of the reader. So you've seen in this demo using XML Writer to write an XML file, and then using XML Reader to read the XML file. And you saw two ways that you can read. You can use the read method to read every piece of the XML, one piece at a time. Or you can use read to following if you want to go to specific elements. And then we used read inner XML to read the contents of those elements. The system.io namespace in the .NET framework contains a number of classes that you can use to write to and read from files on the computer, and also classes for managing drives and directories and managing files, so for instance, copying them or deleting them. To write to a file, you can use the StreamWriter class. The write method of StreamWriter adds text to a file. Write line adds text and a line break to the file. You can use the stream reader class to read from a file. Read will read text from the file, and read line reads entire lines of text from a file. Earlier we saw an example of the file info class. Let's look at it in more detail. The file info class contains methods that you can use to copy, move, rename, create, open, delete, append to files, basically everything you need to do to manage the file itself. You can use the exist property to see if a file exists. And that's handy since you don't want to delete a file if it doesn't exist in the first place. That could lead to an error in your code. So you can use the exist property to check if the file exists. The create method will create a file. This returns an instance of the file stream class that references that file. From there, you can use append text to add text to the file and create text to remove existing text and then add new text. And both of these return instances of the StreamWriter class 
that we just talked about. And we'll see this in code shortly. The file info class also contains a number of properties you can use to look up information on a file, such as the name, the full name, which includes the name and the path, the length of the file, is the file read-only, when was the file created, and when was it last accessed. You can use the copy to method of the file info class to copy a file, and the delete method to delete the file. In addition to managing files, you can use classes in system.io to manage directories. The directory info class is used to work with a directory, and it has methods for creating, moving, and deleting directories, as well as getting a list of all the files in the directory. You can use exist to see if a directory exists. You can create a directory and remove a directory. You can use the name property to return the name of the directory, and the full name property returns the full path as well as the name of the directory. And you can use the drive info class to get information on drives, whether they're hard drives or your CD-ROM drive, for example. The get drives method returns a list of all drives on the computer, and then there are various properties you can use to view information on these drives, including the name, the type of drive, is it a fixed drive, a network drive, a CD-ROM drive? What's the format of the file system on the drive, NTFS, FAT32, for example? You can look up the volume label on a drive, and you can see if the drive is ready. This would be useful if you're going to write code to copy a file to a network drive or copy it to a CD-ROM drive. And you can see the total storage capacity of the drive, as well as how much space is available. Well, let's see a demo on using the file info, directory info, and drive info classes, and how you can perform basic file input and output tasks using the .NET framework. Let's take a look at some examples of using classes in the system.io namespace to work with files, directories, and drives. First, I want to run the demo to write to and read from a file. So I'm going to create a new instance of the stream writer class and pass to it the name of the file that I want to create. If we look in the root folder, we see that that file doesn't currently exist. I'm going to create this new instance of stream writer. And now new file represents the instance of the stream writer referencing that file. Then we'll use the write line method to write two lines to the file and close it. And now, if we go back to the folder, here's the file test.txt, and the contents are the two lines we wrote to it. Next, we're going to use the stream reader to read that file. So we'll create a new instance of the stream reader class and pass to it the name of the file we want to read. Then we're going to go in a loop, and we're going to use the read line method of the stream reader class to read the file line by line. So first, we'll read the first line in the file and store that to the string variable next line and display that. There's the first line in the file. This loop says, do this until next line is nothing. So in other words, keep reading until the next line you read returns nothing. So we should do this one more time because there are two lines in the file. We'll read the second line. The first two times we read a line, there was text to display. The third time we read a line, there was nothing in there, so next line is nothing, and so we exit the loop. And now close the file. Now let's look at an example of using the file info class, which provides more capabilities for working with files. We're going to create an instance of the file info class and point to that file we just created. Then we're going to use the exists property of the file info class to see if it exists, because if it doesn't, we're going to create it. So let's erase that file.
and now we'll run this code. Now some file is an instance of file info pointing to this file and the exist property will return false because the file doesn't exist. This points out something interesting about the file info class and in that you can create a reference to a file whether or not it exists. And if it doesn't exist, you can create it, which we're going to do here. We're going to create it by using the file stream class and calling the create method on that instance of the file class and call the create method on that instance of the file info class. So this variable sum file stream is an instance of the file stream class and that is the result of creating this file test.txt. So now if we go look in the folder, that file exists. Then we'll close the file stream class and get a reference to the file. And now we're going to add text to it. The create text method of the file info class returns a stream reader. So this variable text to add is an instance of the stream reader class. And we can then call the write line method to add a line to the file. We then flush the stream, which is in memory, close the stream reader, and now we can look inside test.txt and see that there's a line in there. The create text method gets rid of the existing text first, and then the write line replaces the contents of the file. Append text will just add text. So now we'll call the append text method of the file info class and add another line to that file. And now if we look inside test.txt, it has two lines. Next we're going to use properties of the file info class to look up information on the file, such as its name, the full name, which includes the path, and the size. And finally, we're going to copy that file to test2.txt. And lastly, we'll delete the file test.txt. There's the information returned by the properties of the file info class, the name, the full name, and the size. Let's look next at the directory info class, which gives us methods for working with directories. I'm going to create a new instance of the directory info class and point to c colon backslash appdev demos, which currently does not exist. So now the exist property of the directory info class should return false, and we'll create the directory. Now you can see that that directory has been created. Now we want to put files into the directory. We're going to create a new instance of the file info class and point to that test.txt file that we were just using. Oh, but look, we get an exception because remember we created this file test.txt and then we deleted it. Now we're running this code which assumes that the file still exists. So this is a perfect example of why when you're doing file input and output, you really need to have some code to test whether or not things exist before you copy them or delete them. There are a couple things we could do here. First, we could have asked to see if the file existed before we went to copy it. We did that with the directory. We said if not demo directory dot exists, then create the directory. We could have said here, if some file dot exists, then do the copying. Or if the file doesn't exist, then create it. Well, let's cheat. Let's create this. I'm going to rename test2 to test.txt. And then I'm going to go back to this line of code and run. So now we've copied this test.txt to the demo directory, and there's the file. OK, 
Okay, next. We're then going to delete the directory by calling the delete method of the directory info class and passing as a parameter true, which gives the delete method the instructions to delete the directory even if there are files in it. By default, the delete would fail if there were files. Here I'm overriding that and saying whether or not there are files in there, delete the directory. And now you can see that the directory is gone. Finally, let's look at the drive info class, which we can use to manage the drives on the computer. I'm going to create a new instance of the drive info class and pass as an argument the root directory of the drive, which is C. So now this variable info represents the C drive. And I can then use properties of the drive info class to get things such as the name, the drive type, and additional information. So here's the name and the drive type. The name is C, the drive type is fixed. And then if the drive is ready, which for the C drive it is, for a CD-ROM drive maybe it isn't, in our case it is ready, then we can use properties to find the label, the drive format, the total size of the drive, and the free space. Let's see those. So in this demo, you've seen various classes from the system.io namespace for performing file input and output tasks. We wrote to and read from files, and then we used the file info, directory info, and drive info classes to manage files, directories, and drives.